Take a look around and find somebody to war eagle. It's showtime. Oh, my God. Well, hello, Auburn, Alabama, and all points around the globe where War Eagle can be heard in return with joy, particularly at the storied crossroads of College of Magnolia, where you heard it, Tip Off at Tumors is back, back, one of the greatest events that uh, that has been held in the uh, city of Auburn. Adjacent to the Auburn campus was tip off at Tumors a couple of years ago before we were banned from living our lives last year. And uh, I made the jaunt over to the loveliest village to partake in the first tip off at Tumors, and it was an absolute blast. So I'm so glad to see that is back. And incidentally, I would have every recruit, every big time recruit possible around for that particular game or weekend, although I believe, let me take a peek here, I think that October 7th, it, is a Thursday, so you got to get those recruits in there on Thursday for the game against that team on Saturday the 9th, um, but man, get them in there to see that event dip off at Tumors, and then the atmosphere that is sure to be present in Jordan Hare for that team that will be coming in on Saturday, October 9th would be a magnificent selling point. Do you not agree? Pardon me while I get a little more headphone in my ears. That's good audio and video. Yes. Yes. And uh, so while we're at it, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to you. And as always, I hope this message finds you truly well and joyful and that you are recovering after yet another godforsaken 11 a.m. brunch ball game. Brunch ball. Nothing says elite performance like breakfast football. Uh, More on that. Yes, indeed. Hello, consumers of Auburn Broadcast Transmissions, and welcome, as always, to Auburn Stuff, the variety show podcast where we discuss the philosophy of life in orange and blue and other stuff that you may or may not find interesting, informative, and entertaining, but that I certainly do. And as we scan the download map, we will also issue out warm greetings as well to our listeners from Kaneka National Forest to Little River Canyon and in Pascagoula, Mississippi, Grand Island, Nebraska. Welcome, Nebraska. Way down in St. George, Utah, in the desert. Point Loma, California. Yeah, you, you know who you are. Annapolis, Maryland. And Melbourne, Australia. My apologies for the terrible attempt at an accent, but um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and I'm indeed flattered to have you on board. Thank you for joining the fun. The current date and time here in the Eastern Time Zone, it is Sunday, September 12, uh, at 1.06 p.m., 13.06 13.06 p.m. or just afternoon in the central time zone. And the current weather at College of Magnolia is 81 sunny degrees in what has been a startlingly pleasant early September, has it not? I mean, I went on and on and on about the weather during the Akron game, and I, uh, from what I heard, it was uh, just as pleasant even though it was played during the most horrible part of the day typically speaking that time between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. ish right in that time when it's the hottest most humid part of the day but it wasn't that bad and even uh, 
even Stan made a comment about it uh, during the radio broadcast, which uh, he would know, having been on that field for a lot of games over four years, that it was typically in early September, as you all know, it is awful, a billion degrees, humid, disgusting, and horrible. And September is quite often smattered with uh, games against lesser opponents, shall we say, and therefore relegated to the 11 a.m. kickoff slot quite often, and that is awful. And speaking of September, summer drawing to a close, um, my wife's company has a policy that they call uh, Summertime Fridays in which they all, they work a, a typical nine to six day Monday through Friday she works in advertising and during the summers which I think it's large I'm un- unsure exactly of the date range but I do believe it is largely uh, a Memorial Day to Labor Day thing they give everybody uh, an early out on Fridays they get off at three o'clock on Fridays which led me to ask her the other day when I heard her uh, telling one of her employees that um summer Fridays had drawn to a conclusion for the year that it didn't make any sense to me to give people an early Friday in the summer when they have the most daylight. In the summertime, you get off at three o'clock. I mean, that's great, but you got five or six hours of daylight ahead of you. Why not? during the most depressing for some time of the year when there's the least light scattered across the surface of the earth in the winter time why don't you give them an early friday in the winter time get them out of there at two or three o'clock on fridays and that way they actually have two or three hours of daylight left instead of walking out of the office in the dark I just don't understand this whole, this, this, uh, ruse of, of summer joy, this marketing of summer comes straight from Madison Avenue, Northeastern, upper Midwestern, uh, the mindset of that region of the country where summer is to be delighted in and summer is the shortest, uh, uh, the, the the duration of summer is the shortest of any other place in the country. So none of that makes any sense to me. And which brings me back around to 11 a.m. kickoffs. I have railed for my entire life and into this microphone for the last four seasons, four, 18, 19, 20, yeah, four seasons about... 11 a.m. kickoffs and how central time zone universities, colleges, schools, football programs should fight back against this most ridiculous of policies. And furthermore, southern schools should really fight back as a safety thing. We're all we're all consumed with everyone's ultimate physical and emotional safety these days. So why don't we talk about, hey, uh, TV overlords. Um, It's not quite the same in Auburn and Gainesville and Baton Rouge and Hattiesburg and Columbia, South Carolina, as it is in South Bend, Indiana or... Uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, or Columbus, Ohio, or uh, State College, Pennsylvania, or any of these places. It's a little warmer and a little more humid down here. So to have somebody kick off a football game at 11 o'clock in the morning, again, you think, well, it's in the morning. It's the nicest part of the day. Wrong. You don't live down here. The early mornings, until the humidity burns off about midday, It's awful. It's disgusting. So give it a rest, man. Furthermore, and more to the point, 
what you saw, and we'll cover Saturday's glorious victory. Glorious, although anemically beginning victory over uh, the Hornets of Alabama State. Uh, What you witnessed in the first half of that game was exactly and precisely what you would expect in an 11 a.m. kickoff for college football. Incidentally, the only place in the universe outside of maybe seven-man private Catholic school football where you would ever kick off a football game that early, high school. Let's let's take a note, uh, a lesson from high school football, shall we? Basically, every high school football game in the entire universe for the history of time kicks off at when? 7.30. Eastern time. They don't play high school football at noon. That's ridiculous. If you tried to kick off a high school football game at noon, you would be, well, let's just say you wouldn't have a pleasant time of it. Were you running such things? But anyway, back to the Auburn game on Saturday. Imagine that. Imagine that. Everybody, I'm sure everybody got a little tense over that start. But if you didn't know, if you couldn't predict a sluggish mental and physical start to an 11 a.m. brunch game, well, then you just haven't been paying attention. Because essentially what this means is you got, y'all keep calling them kids, even though I urge the... uh, the usage of the term adult for these adult individuals, 18 to 23 ish. Anyway, the kids on a Friday, they got a lot going on. They're football players, they're students, they got practice, they got study hall, they got classes, they got tutoring, they got weightlifting, they got film, they got this, that, and the other. And you know what? They got to live a life. Yes, that's right. Even though they're college football players, they are entitled to live the lives of human beings. So you're going to take all of that and you're going to say, hey, after Friday night, we're going to expect you to get up at what? 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, drag your ass to the athletics facility to begin preparation for the day. With whatever treatment you might need, whatever film you need to look at, whatever stuff you need to go over, whatever you need to walk through, whatever taping and whatnot you need to get done to you to get ready to go and then do Tiger Walk two hours before kickoff. By the way, I don't know if you knew this or not, but Tiger Walk is two hours before kickoff. So, just, it's... All right, think about it this way. Um, What is your least productive time of the day? If you are a typical Western individual where you work a typical job, which basically puts you in the office, probably puts you up around, oh, I don't know, um, probably puts you up around 5 to 5.30, depending on if you have young kids or not, to get yourself ready and get out the door and take your stinking dragon-ass commute to your office, even though we all should be working via video anyway, because it works, um, to get there by 8, 8 or 8.30 or 9 o'clock, whatever your time is, and then get ready. What is your least productive time of day? Go ahead and say it. I'll wait. That's right. The time basically right around lunch, before lunch, when you're starving to death and you can't focus because you need uh, uh, calories and nutrition and fuel. And then right after lunch, when you just want to go to sleep, you just want to take a nap. So let's take these youngsters and have them attempt to perform at an elite level during this time. It's not going to work. What you're going to get is what you saw in the first half of the game against Alabama State. Whoop-de-doo, I'm really tired of this nonsense. Which is incidentally why I've been hollering for years about um, universities creating their own 
television networks, so they would not be beholden to the ridiculous transitional whims of the overlords of television. Where you don't find... just It drives me nuts. I don't want to get down that road too much. We're already 15 minutes in. Don't want to go down that too much. Uh, that road too much. 11 a.m. kickoff suck. Stop doing it. One thing, of course, that I know that some of you are screaming out there is that, well, if you win more, they won't stick you on at 11 o'clock. This is true. Just wait. So anyway, that just makes... It, it just... I just wanted to add that. I have a bunch of disjointed thoughts today. They're all related to to the last couple of weeks. Um, but I don't know if they're going to be in any kind of coherent order. So let me put that on the table that, in my opinion, through many years of observation and a basic understanding of human physiology and cognition, that when you get... 18 to 22 year olds uh, to try to perform on an elite level physically and emotionally uh, not emotion well yeah I mean there's some emotional involved but uh, anyway physically and intellectually cognitively which there's an awful lot involved in a football game when you try to do that it's just not going to work it's going to be a slow start and plus you throw in the opponent and look we all try to stay as mentally sharp as we can, but to bring your 100%, everything, your complete focus to an overmatched opponent is tough. It's a challenge, and that's one of those things. That's why a competent coaching staff will overcome that, and you will have what you saw in the second half, which is an adjustment. Let me say that again. A second half adjustment. I know that is a foreign concept to all of us. And by the way, everyone hates the media, right? We love to pick on the media. Now, I've been a part of the media. I've been a uh, photo guy for several different publications, um, including the South Carolina Press Association. So I've shot college football all over this, well, Clemson, Carolina, and on out throughout the Southeast and high school and other college stuff and baseball and things like that. So I've been a part of the media. I know. Um, so no one likes the media. No one trusts the media. Everyone hates the media. Everyone loves to rag on the media. So guess what? Do you know who really loves 11 a.m. kickoffs? The media. The media and Gert and Ira. Because Gert and Ira can get down to the Cracker Barrel before everybody else gets there. And the media loves it because they don't like to be up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning uh, editing photos, uploading photos, and posting, writing and posting stories. So that's who loves 11 a.m. kickoffs. And probably people with small children. But why are you taking your small children to football games anyway i mean like infants and toddlers stop it all right um moving on i heard i've heard this theme throughout listening to a bunch of podcasts and watching videos and whatnot is uh there there's an awful lot of people out there who are saying how surprised they were by how the team executed last saturday after the akron game wow look at that everything is sharp and, and on point and uh Co- cohesive, coherent, all that kind of stuff. Surprised by it. Surprised. Surprised that Bo was whatever he was, 20 for 22, whatever it was, 90%. Um, surprised by everything. That was the common theme that, that would just left me scratching my head was how Surprised everyone was by the result. Nobody expected Auburn to lose to Akron, but my gosh, they were so efficient and excellent and well coached and disciplined. Well, if you were surprised by that, then you really haven't been paying much attention, have you? No, you have not, because we've been talking right here in this space for quite some time about how. Based on the track record of years in the vocation of coaching, 
how Brian Harson was going to run this program. There's no surprise here. And again, it goes back to, I'm going to touch on this again here in a moment, but we, we all, as Auburn people, Auburn family, Auburn uh, fans, we've all, we're, we're all still recovering from the post-traumatic stress of the last, well, since 2009, really, when we've had the, the very puzzling series of events that we've had uh, take over our, our Auburn football fan lives. And it's difficult for us to adjust, to reboot our headspace, if you recall the couple of episodes I did about that, about how things should look when things are run by professionals who know what they're doing. And so that's essentially what you're looking at. And the theme has been everybody has to everybody has to reiterate how they keep having to say, I know it's just Akron. I know it's just Alabama State. And sure, we do have to caveat that. But we don't have to. I think we feel like we have to. Because in the past, games like Akron and Alabama State would have gone much differently and they would have felt much different, which led me to kind of compile a list of frustrations that have led us over more than a decade with the same person in charge of the offense to to this dystopian emotional state in which we can't quite figure out what the hell's going on and why sometimes we're really happy and sometimes we're really sad and don't understand what the hell just happened. So, the Akron game, why should you be happy about it, coupled with the Alabama State game? Because you know very good and well, if you've been around for any length of time at all, how that would have gone in the past. You would have, The Akron game would have been 39 19, which is a handy win, an easy win, except you would have left the stadium frustrated because it would have been, uh, the game would have been fraught with turnovers and mistakes and penalties and inefficiencies and field goals in the red zone. And so you would have walked away with a victory and you would have gone and thrown toilet paper and you would have uh, uh, chalked up you know, the win on the left, the little tally mark on the left side of the column. However, you would have been, your soul would not quite have been as fulfilled as it should have been to where you could actually move on in a healthy fashion to the next game. So I went back and looked through some stuff. And again, remember, we're, we are still recovering. We, the Auburn family, are still recovering from our mass post-traumatic stress. So often we fail to see the forest for the trees. And we've been, been so deeply immersed in sociopathic incompetence that likely as a defense mechanism against emotional pain, we fully embraced utter frustration as simply standard operating procedure. And the first two games of the Harson era have been fun to watch and experience because they've been different. And I'll tell you why. Starting in 2009, games like this, games like Akron and Alabama State, uh, where you had a combined score of 122 to 10. And the 10 points... It was largely was obvious. I mean, they went 46 and a half minutes in that Akron game without giving up a point. And then they started subbing in and then, you know, they made a play or two. They brought in Akron, brought in that other quarterback who was actually looked to me much like a much better football player than than the first guy. And they completed a few passes and ran. They ran a basically a different offense. So they uh, I don't want to say they got lucky to score those 10 points, but, you know, whatever. So anyway, 2009 versus Louisiana Tech. This is a, an entire list over the last, the previous 12 years, minus 2012, uh, because that person wasn't around, of 
games that we should have dominated like we dominated Alabama State and Akron but didn't. 2009 versus Louisiana Tech, final score 37-13, a game which was 13 to 10 at the half. That's what we're used to. A win, a, a, a kind of a handy win. It looks fine, 37-13, but what? It just didn't feel right. 2010, that year where we didn't lose at all. Boy, the defense, for as well as they played in, in some of those games, particularly the uh, national championship against Oregon, the defense was, I don't know, what's the word? Suspect, 2010 versus Arkansas State, 52-26. Now, 52 is a lot of points, but you gave up 26 to Arkansas State. And the second half score, here's another thing that always drove us nuts, is why are we not still scoring boatloads of points in the second half and burying people and subbing in non-starters to get reps just in case your starters get hurt? Or to develop these players for the future. There's a crazy-ass concept. So, 17-10 was the second-half score in that Arkansas State game that year. 2011. Oh, here was a good year. Good year. 2011. Utah State. 42-38. And we were losing by 10 with 338 left in the fourth quarter to Utah State. That same year versus FAU, Florida Atlantic, final score, 30-14, and the score was 10-6 at half. That was fun. And then, near, I guess, uh, between Booger Eater University and Gump, we had Samford, 35-16, and it was 14-13 midway through the third quarter. That's what we're used to. Skipping 2012 because it wasn't here. Going to 2013, which is a real special year, right? Real special year. I got issues with with that year, believe it or not. Um, 2013 versus Arkansas State. 38-9. That seems like a handy win, right? Except it's not. It's Arkansas State and it's not 55-0 or 52-3. It's 38-9 and your line, your box score for each quarter is 14-7-7-10. Not very efficient. And speaking of, uh, I'm going to get to this here in a minute when I wrap this up in my um, barely controlled rage. 2013 featured that game against that team from Athens that we were boat racing at halftime and basically lost the game twice and had to win with a ridiculous, incomprehensible miracle. That game, that year. Anyway, so moving on. 2014. Here's a couple for you. Uh, To start with, Samford again. Samford, Samford, Samford. Sam Ford. 31-7 with a scoreless first quarter. Is that how you go out and beat a team? Dominate a team that you're supposed to beat? 60-10 or 62-0? No, it's not. And here's a bonus, a a bonus turd from the 2014 season. We lost to Gump 55-44. And you think, and that was on the road. That was a chance for an epic road win in Tuscaloosa. Why did we not win that game? Because Daniel Carlson, even though we scored 44 goddamn points, Daniel Carlson had field goals of 20 24, 24, 20, and 33 yards. Five field goals. And when you're on the 20 yard line, folks, I don't, I know I don't need to tell you this, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. When you're on, when you're kicking a 20 yard field goal, you subtract 10 for the end zone and subtract seven for the snap. Well, guess where that puts you? Six or seven, depending on what the kicker wants for his snap. That puts you on the three or four yard line. So you're on the three or four yard line, the seven or eight yard line, the seven or eight yard line, the three or four yard line, and then uh, what? Around the around the twenty, or no, around the fifteen or so. So you had deep, deep inside the red zone. 
you had five field goals in that game. <sighs> Moving on, 2015 versus Jacksonville State. 2015 was a special year, wasn't it? We needed overtime to beat Jacksonville State. I will move on. That same year versus San Jose State. The score was 35-21 versus San Jose State. And it was tied 14-14 and at half. And then in that game between Booger Eater and Gump, we played Idaho and scored some points but gave up 34 points to Idaho 56 34 to Idaho that's what that's why these two games against Akron and Alabama State have been different and you should appreciate them for those differences and embrace it and who gives a shit if it's only Alabama State and only Akron you did what you needed to do which is what we've almost never done in the past And 2016 was a really weird year because this was the only year in this run where we really beat the shit out of everybody that we should have, but then lost some really bad. We I don't think we beat any of our. Or no, we beat. We I was at the LSU game that year. That was the 27 field goal, light the trees on fire year, Uh, and we almost lost that game. So we almost didn't win any meaningful game that year. But we did kick the shit out of everybody we were supposed to. 2017, another game I was at, Georgia Southern. Everybody was uh, I, everybody was cranky during that game because we all felt like we should have, it should have been, you know, I mean, this was Jarrett Stidham and this was kind of supposed to be the new look offense and the high-powered, high-flying offense. And 41-7 against Georgia Southern, it looks good. But it didn't feel good, especially with that uh, turnover, fumble, scoop, and score that Southern did on us in uh, sometime in the first half, I think. Second quarter, early second quarter, maybe late first quarter, something like that. Um, But that's not the highlight of 2017 with this list. We beat Mercer 24-10. Mercer. Mercer. And the score was 10-3 at the half. And we actually, I made note, we lost the time of possession uh, by something like four or five minutes to Mercer and flutzed on red zone opportunities. Mercer converted far more red zone opportunities than we did. And that was a goofy-ass game. I believe, if I do recall, that was an 11 a.m. kickoff. Was it not? And there were... Mistakes and fumbles and penalties and blah, blah, whatnot during that game. And then that same year, 2017, we beat ULM. uh, Hang on. Sorry, I forgot to turn the screensaver off. Anyway, we beat uh, Louisiana Monroe 42-14, which was 14-7 at half. Uh, Moving on to 2018. Uh, We beat Southern Miss 24-13, and it was 14-3 at the half. 2019, we beat Tulane. Tulane, which, let's be fair, Tulane is not Alabama State, but it's Tulane. We beat them 24-6. Again, is that how you're supposed to feel coming out of that? I think not. And then 2020 was, was just, was not a year for this because... We only played SEC teams, and we won six games and probably should have lost at least two of those. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum this up with another little, uh, another little factoid or group of factoids that, should, again, should make you feel better about the start to this season regardless of the opponent. In those 11 seasons that I just talked about from 2009 to 2020, skipping 2012, uh, in in the only games that anybody cares about, the big three and bowls, LSU, Alabama, Georgia, and bowl games, we were 16 and 29. And that doesn't even count the losses that we had against teams that nobody gives a shit about. I don't think I think we have a losing or a tied tied record in that time against Mississippi State. And the record against Arkansas ain't that great. 
Um, and a particular note of frustration to me, as you all know, because you know that I grew up in uh, Marietta, Georgia. <sighs> During that time, we went three and nine versus that team from Athens, three and nine. And that includes a run in 14, 15, and 16 against some of the worst Georgia teams that you'll probably you're probably likely to ever see again. And we scored 19 points per game. Our offensive genius scored 19 points per game. And I'm going to tell you this. If you take out the total points from 2010, 13, and 17, which were the big years, except we played them twice in 17. So the big years of Cam and Nick when we should have lost that game that we had handily in pocket in midway through the third quarter. Um if you just take the scores out of those games and we averaged nine, uh, 10 points per game in nine games against that team from Athens. And in those games, in all those games, in those 12 games, there were 28, 28 quarters that were either scoreless or were field goal only. 28. It is Absolutely and honestly, no wonder that if you're under about 35 or so that you think that Georgia has been some kind of uh, juggernaut, some kind of behemoth from the East. When it's taken this god-awful string of games, this horrifying 20-year stretch of time, because let's be fair to the last guy, it started before him. But he didn't do anything about it. He didn't seem very interested in beating that team. Uh, It took that 20-year stretch of fecklessness against that team from Athens to get to the point of where, what, they're two two games ahead, two, three-something games ahead for up until, what, about seven or eight years ago, the series was tied, and the total number of points scored since 18... 92 was tied. The total points in the series was tied. And that's what that series historically was. So yeah, it's no wonder if you're under 35 or so that you you think differently about that team from Athens than the rest of us who are far older than you. Um, They're just not all that. They're on a little run right now. But with all the advantages they, that they have that Auburn doesn't have of being a state school with all that money and being smack dab in the middle of one of the biggest football talent pools in the universe, they should have a lot more hardware than they do. I'll never forget about that. So let's move on. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm probably going to be running out of time here, and I have rant, ranted about angry things for a while so let's find some happy things and i want to touch on this um again disjointed thoughts the penn state game everybody keeps talking because the media when you have to fill as much airtime as they do bless their hearts um you just have to talk about stuff and it's much much easier to talk about rote banal bullshit than it is to kind of dig into the granular stuff and really figure things out. So we all have to hear the same thing over and over again. Oh, a road, a road game, happy Valley, white out a hundred thousand people. And as I have covered before, a well-coached disciplined team that has an ironclad structure infrastructure and is surrounded by, by competent people, they don't have those challenges in those games. You can take that out. You can remove those factors. You can remove the noise as a factor. You can remove intimidation as a factor. It's as easy, it's really as simple as that. The home team advantage, the the line, the betting line between uh, teams 
that are re- re- relatively equal, the home team gets about three to three and a half points for home. And that's it. The home team doesn't get 10, 12, 15 points. So let's just dispense with all of that nonsense. Competence and discipline and a coherent infrastructure removes those intangibles. So that's enough with that. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things um, from the these two games. Things to love from the Akron game. Things to love from the Akron game. Oh, it was so nice, as I mentioned on that Saturday, to be uh, back among the living with a... Well, we're not going to call it a full stadium. Incidentally, I'm very disappointed in a lot of you who dressed up to go to the football game as aluminum benches and orange seat backs. I know it's Akron and I know it's Alabama State. Get your ass to the stadium or make your tickets available. And also, I understand that some of you are standing in the ramps and some of you are in the concourses and not everybody can be in their seat at all all times with bathrooms and concessions and blah, blah, blah. But there were way too many empty seats at both of these games for the first time back in over a year that we were that we had full stadiums. Anyway, uh, the pregame festivities with the Eagle Flight and Tiger Walk and all of that kind of stuff, all, all the stuff, tailgating, everything that was involved with why we love college football was so nice to have back at that first game. Uh, how about, I don't know, John Samuel Schenker. How about John Samuel Schenker? Indeed. Um, I don't know. Did he set the Auburn program record for tight end receptions? It certainly seemed like it, but that's what, that's what happens when you get a coaching staff, a head coach and offensive coordinator that understands what needs to be done to move the football, which is kind of the point of the whole process, isn't it? And what you saw essentially with not only the tight end involvement, but the running game, the running backs, and everything else was was what we have been missing for lo these many years. Play calling that set the players up for success. Rather than play calling that only made sense within the design of the play itself if there was no defense on the field. And so that's what you get with that. Um, Early player rotation and going deep into the bench on both sides of the ball, something delicious and wonderful to, uh, to observe and to enjoy, and that was with both games, even though this is the Akron list. Because that's how you develop your players. That's how you get reps. That's how you keep players involved. That's how when a player is like maybe a little up in the air uh, as they approach the offseason about whether they want to transfer or not. Well, when you gave them 0.0 reps, why would they stay? They feel like they have no hope. So you give everybody reps. You keep your players involved. You keep your players in love with the program and each other, and you keep them happy and you keep them engaged, right? Yes. Correct, Mundo. So moving on, uh, Bo. Bo was a uh, was a lot of fun to watch in that Akron game, right? Um. Everybody said, how's Bo going to be? Bo this, Bo that. Well, Bo was just fine. And incidentally, bleeding into the Alabama State game, Bo early on, if you're a little unhappy with um, his perceived, I don't know, inefficiency uh, early on, I want you to go back and rewatch and count not only the drops, but also the pass interferences that weren't called. The grabbing of the jerseys coming out of cuts. That happened on that pass that Tank dropped. That little uh, screen, bubble screen, or not bubble screen, whatever the hell that that little uh, that little check down dump off was going to be. Uh, there was a lot of jersey grabbing that they weren't calling, and to the point of altering a player's route. And Bo 
seemingly now being coached to throwing a ball to a spot where a player is supposed to be. Uh, that's going to alter the play. So anyway, um, Bo was excellent um, against Akron and could have potentially been excellent against uh, Alabama State. And incidentally, those of you who are freaking out about Bo's uh, lackluster numbers against Alabama State, if you want to call them lackluster, what about this dude for Alabama? What's his name? Their quarterback? I think he was something like uh, 19 for 29 or something like that. So look, man, just take it easy. The running backs, and this will go for both games, were absolutely stellar. And by the way, I was going to bring this up too. Um, How nice, remember when everybody was freaking out about the running back transfers in the offseason. Oh, my God. The running back room is bare. There's nobody there. Oh, my God. Is Tank going to leave? Oh, my God. Where are all these guys going? Well, how do you feel about the running back room now? I mean, does Bigsby Shivers Hunter sound better than, I don't know, carry on, carry on, carry on, broken carry on? Does to me. So, back to the games. Things to love about the games. Um, About the Akron game. And this will bleed over into the Alabama State game as well since I'm doing a dual, um, a two-game summary because my travels took me out of the loop for recording this past week. The uh, running backs, I said, the def- I put down for the uh, Akron game, uh, TD Moultrie, Derek Hall, Marcus Harris, those guys. But uh, combine that with what we saw f- out of the defense during uh, at- during the Alabama State game, and you got to be feeling really, really good about the defense. And on the whole, for the Akron game, it was simply comforting to see the results of competent and mentally sound coaching. And as I discussed for like half an hour earlier, we all know what would have happened with the status quo ante. And so things to love from the Alabama state game. Again, the defense was stifling pitched their shutout that we wanted from Akron, uh, special teams, all phases of special teams. I guess the, the, um, extra points have seemed a little wonky somehow. And I hope that first missed extra point of the season doesn't loom as some kind of a a goofy little specter that will cost us a game somewhere down the line. But something's up with that. Anyway, uh, special teams was really good. Really fun to watch. I couldn't remember when the last time I saw a blocked field goal for a touchdown was. And I guess it was, I saw 2009. Something like that. Um, I want to say maybe it was Nico Thorpe. And uh, how about this? Second half adjustments. Second half adjustments. They came out sluggish and anemic and kind of not mentally sharp and sort of physically slow and all of that kind of stuff in the first half because they were sleepy. Sleepy football players. Sleepy football players and sleepy fans make for sleepy football. But the second half adjustments, that's a thing that we have, we're not really used to seeing. Every now and then we would see an adjustment like the Texas A&M game I was at in, what was that? Uh, seven, was that 17? No. When was that? 18? 18. The uh, Texas A&M game of 18 where we were just nothing. We were nothing until the last four minutes or so of the fourth quarter and they just decided to say oh fuck it let's do this i guess we should probably try to win this game instead of trying just keeping continuing to smash our face into a brick wall and hoping that the brick wall forgets it's a brick wall we'll just do these other things that have proved proven uh themselves to work since the dawn of time and we won anyway so second half adjustments d effing lightful to see that is enough of that So, I wanted to take a look at the college football scoreboard from this past weekend. And we'll start with the top 25, where 
the Gumpalooskis. Well, damn, maybe I was wrong about that Mercer game because Mercer scored 14 against Alaragadam Bama. Um, didn't see a single second of that game. Have no idea how that happened, and I don't care. Um, another one that I didn't see was Booger Eater University beating UAB. And I did see the weird stat line for their backup quarterback who was like, I don't know, 9 for 10 for 1,000 yards and 70 touchdowns or something like that. It was really strange. I don't know how that happened, and I don't care. Um, Two extraordinarily delicious uh, results from Saturday, starting with the Buckeyes getting their asses handed to them by Oregon in Columbus. Delicious. Is it, If there's anybody, if you take yourself out of the SEC, I'm not sure uh, that there's anybody more detestable, and Lucy agrees, anybody more detestable than Ohio State. I just, they have every advantage in the world and they have no competition around them. It's not like Georgia or Alabama, Florida or Auburn or whatever. All right, let me see what the hell Lucy wants. Apparently, they were just nefarious interlopers um, walking past her window, which just upset her terribly. Anyway, uh, detestable Ohio State loses at home to Oregon. Fantastic. Uh, Oklahoma destroyed Western Carolina. Who cares? This is interesting. Your number five Texas A&M Aggies go on the road to Colorado and win by three, 10 7. I did not see this. If you... Whoa. I guess there's a frog in here. Anyway, uh, anybody know how that game went down? Was it as kind of like embarrassing as the score looks? And then Clarkson beat uh, nobody. And somehow 7th ranked Cincinnati beat Murray State. Notre Dame, I guess any hangover from the Florida State game... Uh, beats Toledo by three points. Toledo. And in a perplexingly ranked game, number nine, Iowa State. Why? Versus number 10, Iowa. Why? Nine and 10. Sure. I don't know. Iowa beats ninth ranked Iowa State at home in, uh, where are they, Ames? By 10. And then our opponent for next week beat Ball State, or as someone I know used to call them, Testicle Tech, um, 44-13. No idea what that looked like. Still think we have a 50-50 chance. We we have an even chance of beating Penn State on the road. (laughs) Said it. Uh, Florida, who cares? Um, Stanford, who I think got, like, embarrassingly beat by somebody they shouldn't have lost to last week, comes out and beats, again, speciously 14th-ranked Southern Cal, beat the hell out of them uh, in L.A. Interesting. Uh, And in the game that's probably more delicious than the Ohio State loss, the goddamn Texas's backs, uh, 15th ranked Texas's backs, Longhorns. Isn't that what we're always told? Texas is back. Texas. I told y'all when these fuckers come to our conference, it's going to be tedious and awful. But Arkansas, I did watch this game, most of it. Arkansas absolutely beat the dog shit up, down, and sideways and curb stomped the shit out of Texas. And it was so fun to watch. Oh, my God. It was so fun to watch. Texas has been wildly overrated for most of their existence. And, of course, lately, Austin is just this filthy stew of disgustingness. And they're so self-involved and so whiny and so concerned with woke bullshit in Austin that they deserve to just meet their demise in a massive conflagration. Figuratively speaking, of course, don't send the black helicopters to me. Uh, Wisconsin, who cares? Virginia Tech, who cares? Ole Miss, who cares? Who cares? Miami, Miami beat App State by two. Again, uh, Miami, who came into the season, what were they ranked before 
Alabama spanked them like a redheaded stepchild. Weren't they like 14 or something? Yeah. Love those preseason rankings. Love the veracity of preseason rankings. Uh, Arizona State, who cares? North Carolina, who cares? And your Auburn Tigers. Um, you know what they did. So that's enough of scores. Um, so finally, I wanted to do this. Uh, look through the schedule after a couple of games. And based on what we saw, give my my thoughts about the upcoming schedule. So, want to know Akron, want to know Alabama State, because we're always want to know, right? Let's hope we stay want to know for the rest of the year. <clears throat> anyway, uh, versus Penn State, based on what I've seen, I think it's, it's a coin toss game. Uh, if we play our best game and they play their best game, I think we win. Uh, Georgia State, who cares? Um, LSU, I said this uh, a while back, and I'm glad I did, and I'm glad I stuck by it, and I said it with confidence. I'm going to say it again. We will beat LSU in Baton Rouge. We will. Then we come home versus BEU. Now, Booger Eater University, I haven't seen them play one single second of football this year, but uh, all of my these Yahoo asshole barking fools in my family and friends um, and people that people in the media in whom I place some credence say that this defense is legit is an all timer. Uh, their offense looked ridiculous, I guess, against. Uh, Clemson and then they did whatever they did like I said the weirdest stat line in the world I haven't seen any of them but it it just seems schizophrenic and strange and putting it this way you can scheme a competent coaching staff can scheme against an excellent defense We've seen three tight end sets. We've seen two to two tight ends. We've seen all this stuff. You can scheme again. You can play jujitsu and parry a team's defense. And you can score some points. So if you can score 20 points against that team from Athens, can you win in Auburn? Probably. Things will have to go right. I think we win that game. We go to Arkansas based on what we saw and coming off the game against Booger Eater University going up to Arkansas based on what we saw last night is going to be a hell of a lot more difficult than we had anticipated. However, our strengths uh, and their weaknesses kind of work in our favor we win that game. Then we have a bye week. Then we go. Then we have Ole Miss at home, which I will be at with Mrs. Auburn stuff. And they just simply, I just don't believe in that group of people. We win that game. Then we go to TAMU, and I have no idea what, what to think of these people now. And we don't really lose that often in College Station, uh, if ever. So we're going to win that game. Uh, I think that Mississippi State is lost, and there's no way we lose that game, especially not at home. And then the the revenge game against USC East over in Columbia, South Carolina. We might win that game by seven touchdowns. And then UAT at home. Look, I'm sorry, but the facts are the facts. I just I don't think they can be stopped. I could that could prove to be wrong as the season unfolds, but they just there they are again with the five star. When, when you got it built in now, when you're six layers deep of five stars at all these positions, then there's just really not physically or uh, from a coaching standpoint, there's just not a whole hell of a lot that you can do. Um, they do, I think they are not as 
good and not as deep as they typically have been in the past uh, on defense, and this team could potentially score some points. Can it score? Our team can potentially score some points against this Alabama team. Can they score enough? I don't know. I don't think so. I just I I, I know it's at home. I just I can't see it right now. I can't envision it. So that has me. Did I just predict a one-loss season? I think I did. Uh, The games that were standing out to us now seem a lot more winnable, Penn State and LSU. Um, Some of the games that seemed maybe a little in hand seem maybe a little more difficult, like Arkansas and maybe Ole Miss, and maybe even that Texas A&M game seems more winnable than it was. So there you go. Those are my thoughts on that, and apparently I have predicted a one-loss season. Uh, it just kind of makes sense. Now there's going to be some coin toss games in there. I I don't know. Again, that the game against the team from Athens with the defense, it's at home, but it's a lot to overcome. And so we got to see how their offense develops if it does over the year. Um, well, not over the year, over the next three weeks, I guess. So there you go. There are my thoughts. On that, So Penn State should be a good game. I think we win that game. It should be a competitive, close game. I think we win that game. At LSU, I think we beat them pretty damn decisively in Baton Rouge. Booger Eater University, that defense is going to be hard, tough to overcome. That might be another 17-16 game. One of those things that... Maybe we maybe that's the game that we lose because we miss an extra point. Ugh. Uh, Arkansas, eh, I don't know. Uh, they look pretty damn good against Texas, but uh, I think we take that. Ole Miss, I don't believe in them. Uh, TAMU, I don't believe in them anymore either. And then Mississippi State. And the good news about the Alabama game is that we get Mississippi State and South Carolina before then so that should play to our favor and then of course all of the uh the unknowns which is injuries and covid and all that stuff will uh unfold as we go but thus far ladies and gentlemen auburn family it has been a joy to watch these first two games even though even though you know even though it's just Akron and Alabama State. Look, I laid out the case for why you should have enjoyed those games and why they are different from the past. So I'm going to get on out of here right now. For those of you on YouTube, appreciate your time. Uh, Hit the subscribe and the bell. Do all that stuff. Take a moment, please, to do that. Help a brother out, will you? Just me running this show by myself here. So I'm going to get on out of here and cue the close. Don't you love that music? I just want to sit and listen to it for a little bit. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. And as always, with this music, I bid you all a good day. Now get on out there and get after it. Do something to make the world a little bit less crappy, will you? Take joy in your Auburn Tigers and many of the other things out there. And as you know, Auburn Stuff can be found at auburnstuff.podbean.com on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, iHeart, Spotify, and lots of other places in the podcast universe and also on YouTube. Please, I encourage you to download and do your listening to the podcast, the audio portion of the podcast on the Podbean app. Download the Podbean app where you can find all of your favorite podcasts uh podcasts live shows and other audio subscribe and hit the bell and if not on apple Podcasts, iheart all those places incidentally iheart remains by far and away our most popular download site i hope they're not all bots uh but whatever your platform please subscribe give a little review 
and a rating because you know what that does. Otherwise, we just get buried and disappear. And on YouTube, subscribe and hit the bell as well. If you'd like to drop me a line about any of my insane rantings, you can do so at auburnstuff at yahoo.com or you can use that Twitter thing if you're so inclined. I think my handle is at Stuff Auburn. Uh, you can also use Instagram, the gram, IG, and that's just Auburn stuff there. Um, and remember this, folks, as I say, actively support. It is more important than ever to actively support the things that you hold dear, the things that you love, the things that you value. And that's anything from a like to a subscription to a uh, uh, a, a rating, a five star rating, a little one, one, two, three, four word uh, comment or review because they've got us algorithmed and we need you to stay alive. And with that, I encourage you to be mindful, be fit, and be authentic because sometimes it's all you have. But when it comes right down to it, It'll always be all you ever need. Until next time, War Eagle, everyone, and see you down the road.